would like to welcome you to today's webinar. We have two speakers today. Dr. Idri started with APHIS Veterinary Services as the Aquaculture Program Manager in 2005. In 2009, he was selected to the newly created position of Farm Animal Welfare Coordinator, and he supports the activities of veterinary services with regard to the World Organization for Animal Health within SNP Office of the International Affairs. Dr. Egri's father was also named Paul, so he has always been called by his middle name, Gary. So if you're confused why his email is paul.g.egri, he refers to himself as Gary. Dr. Kristen Wood is a poultry specialist, veterinary medical officer with USGA APHIS Veterinary Services in District 1 on the East Coast. She received her DBM from Michigan State University, MPH from the Pennsylvania State University, and BS degree in Agriculture Animal Science from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. In her position as poultry BMO, she is responsible for organizing avian influenza surveillance, live bird market stakeholder education, poultry disease traceback activities, and biosecurity education. Dr. Wood began working as a veterinary medical officer for USDA in July of 2004 and has experience with poultry handling education through developing the poultry handling transportation training with U.S. Poultry and Egg Association. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Dr. Egri and Dr. Wood. Thank you, everyone. And actually, I was laughing there because just before we started, we were talking about how to pronounce my name, and I was saying that about 90% of the people pronounce it as Egri, so I learned it as Egri. And I, and I usually don't correct people, but I'm going to correct it now because we just talked about it. Anyway, just a side, a side joke. Anyway, it is a pleasure and honor to be presenting to you today on a, as you can see here in front of you on the title, it's a grassroots project titled Video and Techniques for Handling Poultry. I, along with my co-host, this here on the screen, Dr. Kristen Wood, will discuss how this video came to be. We'll touch on the main points of the video just before we show it. And then we'll have the premiere showing. This is the first time we're showing it to anyone outside of a very small group of people, uh, which the video only lasts about five minutes. And then we'll take some questions and comments, and so we'd certainly like to hear your thoughts on the video. Um, of course, slide. And of course, Chris Lynn, as we discussed prior, please, if, 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 if you want to say anything, jump right in. So, you know, anyway, uh, I didn't go to the uh, Bureau of Newcastle event in Southern California in 2018. I wanted to go, I was interested, um, but I did ask for, I was, I was interested in how the animals were being handled, so I did ask for photos of what was happening. And when I received these photos, and this is how the idea for this project came about, I was looking at these images of the depopulation process, and it, it, what struck me was that this trailer here it's carrying equipment for administering the CLC. I'm going to ask Chris to, to talk about it because I didn't have my personal experience with it. But it's parked right, be right between what looks like two dense residential buildings. You know, we're not out in the farm. We're not out at a big building. It looks like we're in a community of people here. And uh, Chris, do you want to mention this? what this is just for folks' awareness? Sure. Yeah, so this is a um, modified atmospheric kill uh, trailer. Um, so it has the carbon dioxide um, cylinders on the end, and the birds would be loaded into the trailer, and it's closed up, and then the, the carbon dioxide gas administered, and then once the birds kind of expire, it's, they're dumped out. So in um, the VND outbreak in California, um, yeah, I went a couple of times there um, to respond to the incident, um, either this MAC uh, CO2 trailer would be used, or for smaller um, premises where there were just a few birds, we would we had kind of a retrofitted um, trash can that would be have um, tubing connected to the carbon dioxide um, containers. Um, carbon dioxide was the main method used to depopulate the birds, but you can see in this area, as Dr. Egri mentioned, um, in Southern California. Um, we were working with uh, residential in residential areas uh, where people were not used to seeing us at all. You know, we're dressed in Tyvek suits. We look very scary. It's tempting for them to, you know, take out a cell phone or um, record a video of us because we just look so strange. Um, so it was really important um, 
to make sure that our um, responders you know we're handling the birds um, properly and humanely. And so, yeah, so here's another photo. And what I see here are what, what I envision are people that are living in co close quarters with poultry. Uh, they're, they're certainly going to be quite comfortable and confident and capable of handling their own birds. And so I'm looking at us handling their birds. And I just want to make sure in, in my mind as I'm looking at these photos that we're as competent as I imagine that they are. Uh, here we see someone again. This is some. This is in their backyard now. Uh, we I can't. We can't see any of the owners of these birds in any of these photos uh, that I'm looking at, or that we're all looking at now. And but I am imagining as I'm looking at these photos, I'm imagining owners watching us and watching the responders removing their birds for depopulation. Uh, again, these would be people who have cared for these birds. I presume they would not want to see their birds mishandled, even if it is to kill them. Right, and just to add, we did have some animal rights activists during the VND outbreak, you know, take videos and photos of um, the responders and try to, you know, paint us in a bad light. Um, but, you know, to my knowledge, no one, you know, had mishandled any birds, but the, the purpose of this video is to provide an additional training tool um, to the depopulation team or anyone handling poultry, just so they feel more confident in how to handle the birds properly, um, you know, understand their, their job better and be able to have those discussions one-on-one -on -one with their depopulation uh, team leads. Sure, and as Kristen was just mentioning, you know, I'm imagining that the responders here to these, to this and any particular avian disease emergency, they might be tasked with, you might be called to remove live birds from a variety of housing situations. And the responders, before they come there, are gonna have varying levels of poultry handling skills to begin with. You know, we're not all Chrislin Woods. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, just to add to that, um, yeah, during the high pass AI outbreak um, in 2015, uh, we had a lot of contractors and in, um, involved with the big commercial poultry houses. So this uh, video can also be used as a training tool for them, you know, or just anybody, because um, a lot of the contractors, they did not have any poultry experience, like some of, you know, the USDA or Department of Agriculture staff might have some experience. Um, but yeah, some of the contractors, they were working on oil rigs and had never touched the chicken or seen a chicken up close before. So this video could be helpful for anyone. You know, and, and as Chris was again just mentioning, is this anyone and particularly for the techniques to move toward capture and restrain poultry, which is what how we're defining the handling. It's it's not what you do once you have the bird, we're not talking about the depopulation or whatever you do from that point forward. But this is the point you show up and you need to get your hands on those birds to restrain it and then to do whatever you're going to do with it. And how this training could uh, then help responders approach each situation competently and with the skills needed to accomplish their tasks safely, both the responder and the birds. Again, we know what the outcome is, but we don't want to uh, cause mayhem in that process. So Dr. Egri, he applied for uh, a grassroots uh, project grant and was successfully um, accepted for the for the uh, the funding and so that's how the funding for the video came about. Um, so how we kind of envision this video would be used, it would be used in conjunction with um, a depopulation team or anyone responding to an outbreak or any size incident if they need additional um, training on how to handle poultry, you know, this video could be shown. And then there would also be one-on-one -on -one training with their depopulation team lead, or even if it's just surveillance testing, um, you know, it would be used in conjunction with one-on-one -on -one training. Thank you. So that as, as so there began the process, again, developed the grassroots project and it was in fiscal year 2019. And yes, that was a long time ago. And I'll just say that the delay was because we just finished this filming about a month or two before COVID was even a word. You can see here on these photos, there's no masks to be found. 
and COVID seriously disrupted the production portion of the video. Anyway, um, as I was developing this grassroots project, I don't have any experience handling birds. My kids now have birds. That's great. They had my kids handle birds better than I do. So first thing I need to do is identify somebody, to, an expert, to handle and demonstrate these skills uh, and then describe the relevant poultry behavior and poultry handling techniques in a manner that facilitates learning for the intended audience. And here are, here are there two. First was Dr. Ken Anderson here on your left. He's a professor and extension specialist. And as in the video, you'll hear him say the precious department of poultry science. When you hear that word precious, he actually did say that word. So it's within the five, first five seconds, you'll hear him say like a very unusual word. So yes, he says that. He's from North Carolina State University and he's been, he's a, a, a long, long CV. I, I'll just say he's been there since 1990 and in the bird world, he's really well known. So too many accolades to talk about right now. And Dr. Kristen Wood, he's, who's here with us today. She's a poultry specialist and we heard from a bio BMO and District 1 field operations. So, Kristen, right. did you so know you were going to do this? Yeah, I did not know I was going to do this. <laughs> when I was working with Gary a couple months before, you know, it was mostly as a subject matter expert behind the scenes, working with the, you know, main talking points and the script. Um, and I was surprised. Um, he called me on like a Monday and said, hey, Kristen, are you available to come to fly out to North Carolina? this Friday to help shoot the video. I was like, what? And he said, oh, you know, we, we feel as though it, the video would be more successful if there were two people talking back and forth, you know, in addition to there's a narrator in the video that discusses more of the um, poultry handling points. But if, you know, two people could be talking back and forth and especially um, since I had experience working with the poultry handling transportation, um, uh, program that is now part of uh, U.S. Poultry and Egg, and um, I had experience with um, the biosecurity for the birds uh, videos. Um, yet Gary asked me if I could um, could come, and luckily I was available, <laughs> and and it worked out very well. Great, that's fantastic. So we got the experts, and then we needed to identify where we can do the filming. And so we need a premise that which filming could be conducted, which we found beautifully at North Carolina State University. Uh, Kristen, can you mention what we're looking at here or where we are? Right, so this is inside one of the research uh, barns. Um, they had lots of space for a cage layer um, for their research projects, but this worked out very well to help simulate, um, simulate um, what a cage layer um, barn would look like and showing how you would capture and handle the bird, cage layer birds from uh, um, the oh. cages. Oh, what happened? Can you still hear sorry. me? I'm it was, oh, sorry, it was, it was, I'm fine. It was normally. So, Chris was over here. Mm -hmm. If you can see my arrow, my, and she's directing and started filming. And then uh, we needed to identify professional videographers who had specific experience in filming uh, not only agriculture, but poultry. And so we had these two gentlemen, we'll mention their names later, but they ended up being the directors. They, they knew what they wanted to see. Uh, they, they, they could hear. I, I think we, we, they had the script beforehand. And um, I don't know, Kristen, do you want to talk about your experience? And you know, we only had one day and how this went. Yeah, so Gary, you had the vision to start with and you kind of gave your uh, vision to the directors and I think they captured it, you know, very well, um, you know, and you talked to them and said, oh, let's start with um, an opening outside, opening scene to kind of set the stage for where we are at. We were at North Carolina State University and then move inside um, to go into the specific discussions about how to handle the, the birds. Um, everyone was uh, great to work with. Um, yeah, we were under a huge time crunch. We only had one day to get the video done. So there were um, different scenes that we already had kind of pre-planned to uh, set up. And um, I was a little spoiled before when I worked with the USDA um, biosecurity for the birds uh, videos because we had a teleprompter. So this time, since this was you know, shorter video and um, short time crunch. 
I had to memorize my lines, so <laughs> I was uh, had to wing it a little bit, but it worked out well. And, and Dr. Anderson, he's a natural poultry professor for many years, so he was more of a natural, but it worked out well. Oh. And this is a shot just showing um, the audio person um, putting the um, the uh, microphone. We quickly learned that um, Tyvek and audio don't go well together <laughs> just because of the noise. So we kind of had to learn to um, do our audio um, more as a voiceover when we were not moving in the Tyvek suit. I remember, I remember when we were filming, it was, it was early on, because we were also filming out of order. We were filming where we, where we started, and they had to move the equipment around and look at the daylight. And there was one point where I think Chrislyn had purple gloves on, purple, you know, rubber gloves, and they broke and they tore. And and we we did a different scene. I gave her blue gloves, and she's no, no, I need the purple gloves. Like, don't worry, no one will even notice. She's like, they will notice. And so I have to. I don't think we noticed because the way we cut it. But you know, she was definitely concerned about seeing consistency. I'm like, just go for it. <laughs> so anyway, it was a good experience. Okay, so. Uh, but of course, it's not only about the stars, uh, Dr. Wood and Dr. Anderson. It, it did take a team of people to get this done. Um, certainly, with the directors, I think that he, I may have had his, as said, the vision. It was really the cameraman, Martin Brown, his audio assistant, Matt, who, with their experience of of what sounded good, and you know, they're watching, they're 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 looking at what we're going to be seeing so you know i think our, a lot of a lot of success does rely on them to you know they're seeing the final product and you know, what would look good to them so i'm I appreciate their experience bring their experience to this effort um, the, the production even though it was held, held up by COVID, it was a one-man team uh, down at the usda creative media and broadcast center so down in the usa building there's a full audio center on one of the wings and it's kind of neat to see the backroom scenes of the chair where the Secretary of Agriculture sits on and all the photos of all the other secretaries and where they set up their video. So it's kind of neat, a little background scene that's happening there, but um, it's a one-man show and he's very busy. If you, have, you imagine one person for all of USDA for the filming. So that, that, that also did slow down the production. Someone had to write all this. So, uh, so that somebody had to write a lot of stuff for Chris Lynch and Dr. Anderson to memorize. and. That was a group of people, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm not the expert, and so we did reach out to the AVMA and specifically Dr. Sia Johnson to, if, if not write it, have her help lead an effort of others, other experts to draft the language. And so we found through the, um, through a committee of the AVMA, Dr. Kate Barger, a director of World Animal Welfare at Cobbs Fantress, um, and Michelle Crom. And, Many accolades from her technical services at Jenny O' Turkey. So, two folks from industry helped write the script that you'll see in the video itself. Oh, what happened there? Do you see the slides normal? You're good. I'm not sorry. Okay, I see some. Um, we it w so while they were the primary script writers, there was certainly a lot of input from others. Uh, in industry and with APHIS Veterinary Services. As Chris mentioned, it was based on the bachelor's proposal, book written by myself, so thank you. And with that, um, Chris, do you want to mention just the, the main points that we'll see um, in the video? Yes, and I just wanted to mention um, Mary Stevens. She was on the grassroots uh, proposal team, so thank you, Mary, uh, for your help with this, with the funding and getting us to get to this uh, webinar to premiere the video also. Um, so some of the main points that we tried to focus on in the video for poultry handling were mostly for the responders to um, feel confident with handling the birds and you wanna minimize bird stress by moving quietly and slowly with a plan. Um, so. The plan, you know, for depopulation would be discussed with your your depopulation team lead, for example, and um, with Newcastle disease in California, carbon dioxide was the plan. However, in other outbreaks, like high pass AI with um, turkeys, 
um, and broiler chickens uh, it is more commonly foam depopulation. But whatever the method um, is for the depopulation, the main focus for the responders is to um, not stress out the birds um, and feel confident with handling them. So um, focused on handling birds humanely and avoiding damage or injury. So for example, we try to discuss a couple of examples in the video, um, cage layers, for example, you would handle them by grabbing the um, hock joint um, and pulling the shanks together. And we have a, a still shot to kind of show that um, where you hold the birds at um, and lifting them carefully out of the cage um, to avoid the wings from getting caught in the cages and um, placing them in the you know container for the carbon dioxide depopulation. Uh, for larger floor birds like turkeys or broiler chickens, you would um, more commonly herd them or just keep them in, in a certain area. You might confine them to a tighter area for foam depopulation. So we talk about how to herd them carefully. Um, sometimes you might use flags or other visual things to move them, but move them slowly to avoid piling or additional um, stress on the birds. And then lastly, to maintain good biosecurity, you know, we demonstrated that in the video wearing the full PPE, um, including um, the Tyvek suit, gloves, boots, um, hair net and goggles and respiratory uh, mask as well. We tried to demonstrate that. Um, so I think those are the main points, Dr. Egri. And I think we are ready yeah. to premiere the video. That's <laughs> Excellent. We are ready and I will give up control and we'll have the video lasts about five minutes and I think we'll take Q&A, question and answers after that and certainly your input on the video we're very interested in. I was hoping we, uh, the uh, the USDA Production Center downtown has offered to re reproduce or at least re-edit parts of the video if we'd like. So if you have input before I think we've decided that uh, Friday, October 9th, I'm looking at my calendar really quick. Uh, two, or the eighth, and I think they'll, uh, we'll hear how you can see this video or provide comments. So thank you very much for your input and on, on we go. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ken Anderson, professor and poultry extension specialist here at North Carolina State University in the Prestige Department of Poultry Science. And hi, I'm Chrislyn Wood Nicholson, a poultry specialist, veterinary medical officer with USDA Veterinary Services. Today we're going to uh, learn how to uh, capture birds in both floor pens and in cages. It's important that we always approach birds uh, in an environment in a non-threatening manner, easy pace, slow, even movements, so as to not frighten the birds and cause them to pile in corners and possibly trample the birds as we move through the system. It's important to remember that birds are prey animals and they have a negative response to human beings because we are predators. And it's important that we potentially actually get down on their level in floor pens and that we approach cages uh, in a non-threatening manner. So if you're watching this video, you're probably on a depopulation team or a depop crew. So we're gonna suit up in personal protective equipment or PPE and we'll be right back. So he grabbed one leg and then he's grasp the legs just above the hop joint uh, to secure the birds. He has both legs so that bird is firmly secure. What you don't want to do is hold the bird too loosely at the toes because they may break and they feel less secure. But when you hold them at the legs or at the hop joint, just above the hop joint, they feel the most secure. There's a number of ways that you can get into a floor pan and capture birds. One being a leg hook, where you can bring the bird towards you and then grab both legs. Another, for birds that may be somewhat wild and hard to capture, is the net. So with the net, you would just go over the birds quickly, and once they're secured, one or two birds, you can quickly go in and grasp the birds by their legs and remove them from the net. Also for larger birds, floor birds like turkeys, I like to use flags 
because when you wave them, you can put a plastic bag, it makes a little bit of noise, and it also is a visual stimulant to help herd the birds where you want them to go. And that's great because we know that some of the large uh, birds, such as turkeys, don't fly, so the flags work really well and they herd the birds. It works really well also with waterfowl because they herd very well. In all systems, always move quietly and slowly within the environment where the poultry are raised to minimize stress, fear, bird injury, and the potential for piling and flightiness. In enclosed housing, reducing the light intensity may also help calm the flock and reduce fear behaviors. Although the birds are going to be depopulated, they need to be treated with respect. Challenges in caged systems include multi-tier caging and birds that are not handled regularly and may show panicked escape responses. Because laying hens often have reduced bone strength, these behaviors can lead to damage to the wings and keel. Catch the legs near the hock and bring the shanks together. Care should be taken not to tangle birds in equipment or to force birds through solid barriers. Handler hand size, bird size, and equipment design will determine how many hens a handler can catch and transfer at one time. Avoid transferring hens between handlers, as it is best to have only one handler capture a bird and move it to the destination. Hens may be carried upright and close to the handler's body or by both legs with the hocks pressed together. Either method will reduce wing movements and fear reactions. Similar to conventional caging, birds in cage-free systems such as floor-reared or aviary housing may or may not need to be handled individually or in groups. When approaching cage-free birds, their flight zone and avoidance behaviors can cause flight or piling behaviors which can result in injuries and suffocation. Remember to move slowly and quietly to minimize these fear behaviors. Also consider reducing light intensity. Do not throw or drop the birds during the transport process. Birds in range systems will likely need to be live handled in some way. Where possible, free range birds should first be moved to their indoor housing. Many free range hens will return to their housing at night. If possible, hens should be left contained until crews are available. Hey, Crystalyn, we've had a great day today. It's been a pleasure having you here. Yep, thanks, Ken. So that wraps up our poultry depopulation video focusing on bird handling. Um, if you have any specific questions, please talk to your depopulation team lead or your biosecurity team lead to make sure you're doffing your PPE appropriately as you leave the facility. We hope this has helped you a lot uh, in your future endeavors with depopulation and handling of birds. Great, so thank you. Thank you for everyone who stuck around. I can't see any participants. I don't see any comments or questions. So um, if if Liz or if any of the event producers if can help us uh, have any communication with the audience, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to take them at this time. And if you have any comments on the video, we'd certainly like to receive that as well. And that's why I said we had some great comments, great video, well done. Oh, okay. Um, I think it's definitely going to be used. Um, so do we have any other questions that we want to put in the chat? And um, another thank you for developing the video. Um, I think it's best if you have comments about the video to go ahead and contact Chrislyn and Paul or Gary about, um, about the video. Um, it was well-organized video and good to know examples of grassroots projects. Yay. Um, great. You might want to mention surveillance testing as a purpose. Uh, yes. Yep, that's a good point. Thanks. I think a great addition would be to include a list of the PPE you're using. And we do have a question. What are your suggestions about physically handling larger birds like tom turkeys instead of just herding them? I can take that question. Um, typically for larger tom turkeys, 
um, they try to herd them even um, in normal um, slaughter. Uh, um, for slaughtering, they usually herd them, uh, but there are times where they may need to handle just a few turkeys and they would handle them by the wing and by both uh, legs to, you know, place them in the crate if the turkey was unable to walk. Um, but typically, yeah, the, the floor raised birds are kind of herded into an area. Okay, and I think this is going to be a really important question a lot of people are going to ask. Um, you know, will this be published online for availability to stakeholders as well? So I think we're still trying to figure that all out, right, Paul? Where it's going to be put. Or Gary, I'm sorry. I think we're, we're yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out where it's being put. And, and I also do recall that as, as part of the development of the video, it was UEP, oh no, it was the U.S. Poultry and I guess it was UEP, or both wanted to see the final video and for they themselves be able to incorporate it in whatever they're doing if they want it. So I know they wanted to use it or have access to it or see it, or a piece of it or edit it further or whatever. So I think they like the idea and they'd like to use it, so. Sure. Yeah, I think it has a great potential um, for a lot of people to be able to utilize this video. So. You know, I think um, Gary and Chrislyn and I will talk about where we want to get it posted and then we'll sure, certainly send out something um, so that everyone knows. Um, we do have another question. What are the signs of avian flu and is there a procedure in handling them? Yes, I can take that question. The signs of avian influenza um, can vary. Um, sometimes we see, um, uh, respiratory signs in the bird, difficulty breathing, nasal and ocular discharge, swelling around the eyes. Um, sometimes you can just see nonspecific signs of birds that are um, lethargic, ruffled feathers, depressed, and um, commonly with high pass AI, what we see is birds that just die. Um, but for the birds that are alive um, during a um, outbreak, we need to humanely depopulate them. So, um, again, the, the method is going to vary depending on the situation and that will be discussed with your, um, like, depopulation team lead and they will kind of direct you. But the focus of this video was to help the responders feel com more confident in how to handle the birds to get them to that point, whether it be carbon dioxide or or foaming or something else. Okay, any tips about handling rat bites? Oh, good question. We we rarely handle rat bites uh, like ostriches and emus. They're very rarely handled. Um, and we did not talk about that in this video at all. We kind of focused mostly on the more common uh, bird types, um, chickens and turkeys, um, laying chickens, uh, broilers, and turkeys. Um, yeah, so we didn't focus on that. Um, I will say uh, ducks, I'll talk a little bit about ducks. Ducks is very difficult to, are difficult to depopulate because with carbon dioxide, because they have a, um, they can hold their breath for long periods of time. So we um, use, um, Cervical dis dislocation using Berdizo commonly for, for ducks. Okay, another um, question is, is it better to burn them or bury them? That's gonna depend on the scenario too. Um, in the area that you're in, is the, um, the ground, how close are you to a water source, like a stream or a river and the, um, regulations for like the Department of um, Environmental Protection, do they allow burial? Um, you know, how close are you in the residential area for burning? It's all gonna be dependent, but that advice is gonna come specifically from your depopulation team lead during an outbreak or an incident. The next question is, is there any consideration on how to handle aggressive game fowl slash fighting roosters? Yeah, good question. Uh, so for game fowl fighting roosters, 
Um, the main thing to consider is that they uh, have spurs um, and um, sometimes the owners, uh, there may be other um, things on their legs that would, that they use for fighting, um, but you can talk to the owners about that. But the main thing is to um, try to handle them confidently, you know, grasp the legs and the, um, sometimes you may need to hold the, the wings down together so that they're not flapping, um, but you do have to be careful of the spurs um, if they do have them, the spurs are usually on the roosters, not the hens. So hope that helps a little bit. And then I think I saw something about um, fatigue uh, for the responders. Right. Yeah, it's just important to, um, you know, try to, and, and during incidents, um, the uh, um, response team, you know, they, they, they understand these things and they try to work, you know, so that there's not a lot of, too many farms scheduled in a, in a day. Um, there's breaks, adequate breaks in between, um, because we understand it, it, it gets to be very tiring, you know, doing the work and it's hot and you're wearing Tyvek suit and, you know, you have people that could be on video, trying to video you and, you know, it, it is a difficult job. Um, so that, those discussions are usually held, you know, one-on-one -on -one with your depopulation team lead or if you're just doing surveillance with your team lead. Is there any connection to re respiratory problems with turkey and other birds due to blue-green algae? I'm not sure about, you said blue-green algae? Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know specifically about uh, blue-green algae and respiratory signs. I'm, I'm not sure I can look into that though. Another, this is a common, creating some type of a catch pen in the corner of a floor pen can be helpful to safely catch the bird. Um, another question is, when would a person choose to handle the bird by holding them like a football? Some producers don't want their birds held upside down at the shank. Right, I'm just trying to see the, the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chris, and I'll let you do the last two about the football thing. About and okay. the one I'll ask, I'll, I'll make a comment about the catch pen because I I think when I as we, I was watching the video again for the first time in a while, I see we repeat ourselves. We say the same things two and three times. So I think we can certainly edit it. And I think I saw there were some examples of us using catch pens or are you you guys hurting eat, hurting the chickens into a corner with like you know little barriers. And so I see here, I think it was Megan talking about catch pen. So I think we, we would like to edit that video. So I think maybe we can have a voiceover talking about catch pens in a point where you're actually doing the catch pen and because we can delete a lot of repeated parts of it. But anyway, so that's, well, I think uh, that's a good point about the catch pens and to Chris Lynn, we'll, we'll, we'll chat about that offline. Do you see the comment about the football hole? Yeah. I yeah, can read it. Okay. I'll, you can go ahead. You can. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Yep, from Michelle. So, yeah, I guess in a few situations you might want to handle the bird a little bit more carefully. Is if you know you know that bird is someone's pet and they're very emotional over that or emotionally attached to the to the birds. You know, you can handle them a little bit more carefully, upright. You know, like a football hold um, before you place them. You know, in the area for the carbon dioxide. Um, if, if so, if you feel as though, yeah, the, the producer is extra sensitive about that, you can hold them that way. But when you first grab the bird, typically you would hold them by the feet and then, um, you know, bring them out of the cage or area and control the wings the same. So I hope that helps. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Sorry, this is, this is Gary. Uh, this, these last two things about the football hold, uh, just for folks' awareness, and I think, Kristen, you're aware, this did come up at the beginning of the drafting for the screening, the screen, the screen play is because we started talking about catching one bird one at a time, holding it upright like this, up against your body and only doing one bird at a time. And that certainly is probably the nicest way, you know, from someone who personally doesn't handle birds, I can imagine, yeah, that's probably, uh, that's probably the nicest way, especially if the owner's sitting there looking at you, as Kristen mentioned, they're emotionally attached, 100%, that sounds like a great idea. 
from a practical perspective, when we're hearing from the other screenplay writers and other it, others that input it into the video, they're like, yeah, you could do that, but no. You know, if, the, if, if, if you took away that personal aspect for the person wanting the birds, there, the other comment was it's very appropriate and safe to hold the birds upside down by the legs and and can be done. So I think that's where the video was. But uh, and we we took out that the football hold and and holding it that way and one and doing one bird at a time rather than multiple birds from the practical perspective of doing it a depopulation scenario. But maybe Chris, when we could talk about that, is is that something we can be included as it is appropriate. In, in the situation, again, with an owner watching you. But if you're depopulating 100,000 birds and the owner is like, you know, not there, in really personally interested in the birds, just wants to get it technically done, I think upside down is also appropriate. But, um, that's right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, you, you covered that really well, Dr. Agri. Um, yeah. So, in the, in the poultry industry, yeah, holding the birds upside down is a humane way to handle them. You know, until you get them to the the place. You know, it's very temporary, a couple seconds to get them to the other area where they need to be um, handled. Um, yeah, and and for efficiency, yeah, you can't handle one bird one by one all the time, and it's going to depend on the um, the person. Um, but sometimes you can carry up to three to maybe five birds. Um, you know, at a time to to the area where you need to um, put them in the field to chamber. Um, it depends on the weight of the bird and, and the type of bird. Okay, this one additional comment, um, explaining how to drive the birds into the catch pen would also be helpful. Moving them slowly along a wall toward the corner pen. Um, and then another yeah, question when dealing point. with pull. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, that was a good point. I think we kept, we're writing, I'm writing some notes and um, we can try to see if we can add that in. We, yeah, like Dr. Egri said, we had that in the video, but we didn't maybe explain it fully. But yeah. yeah. And you will get a, you will get a copy of all the chat questions so that you have those. Right. Um, and the last question we have is when dealing with poultry, is there a certain way to handle their drinking water when dealing with CO2 chambers? Yeah. Good question. So, um, if you're dealing with uh, um, birds um, that might have the drinking water or the um, the water lines or the feeders, it's very helpful to raise them so that when you go in as a responder, you're not tripping over um, things. So that, that is a good point to try to raise the drinker and feeder lines if you can. Okay, do we have any additional questions? Okay, if not, I'd like to thank um, everyone for joining today. I think there will be um, information that will be sent out by uh, Gary and Chrislyn about where this will be posted. Once um, everything is possibly, you might be doing a little more editing. And um, I think it was a great webinar. Thank you both for, um, this grassroots project, it was certainly wonderful. And um, I wish you all to have a great rest of your day.